just uh, thought I'd share a brief report. So part of my role with the South Australian Conference is uh, ATSIM directors, uh, uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Ministries um, director. There's about 46,000 Aboriginal people across South Australia. Uh, 18 of those, 18,000 live in Adelaide. The remainder in uh, places like Port Augusta, uh, Wyala, um, and then more remote areas like the APY lands and uh, Pipipedia and Udnadatta. And uh, so I'll just share a little bit of um, my work in Adelaide and some of the folk you may recognise um, on the screen. So uh, we've, uh, we've got a group of between 10 and 20 folk regularly coming to our uh, services there in Adelaide at the moment. We had a little outing there um, a few weeks ago and, uh, and um, uh, just uh, gather there. Some, some have been to Mamarafa College and some are going to Mamarafa College. So in my previous life I worked over at Mamarafa College in Western Australia, a Bible college for Aboriginal people from around Australia. And so it was, it was lovely to catch up with them when I moved to Adelaide. And uh, some of those are coming along to the, the group, including Linny Naylor there with a mask down around her chin. And um, then we've got some children there that uh, come along. My, my daughter is in the middle on the, the left there, the oldest one. Uh, a couple of ladies here from uh, now living in Adelaide, you might recognise, uh, but uh, they're both from a, a community of 200 people in the north of here, where I'm heading next, is um, I think according to the census there were 204 people in Udnadatta. And so on the uh, on your right is Maria, and Maria is the chairperson of the local uh, Aboriginal corporation in Udnadatta, and her aunt uh, Dulcy um, is uh, also from Udnadatta but living in Adelaide. And that was just after one of the church programs. Uh, also, uh, Dulcie's uh, cousin sister, Audrey, and um, and uh, a dam up there at uh, Udadana that was used um, as a baptismal font a few years ago for Millie Myson, who you'd know from here in, in Port Augusta now at um, Wamikata. Uh, we have a weekly Bible study group, and that some of the Port Augusta folk join by Zoom. Uh, Mickey helps with um, Hannah and Stacy and Clyde and um, I think we had Karen on once. Um, and uh, so our group meets at Elizabeth Church uh, in the hall there and we project up onto the screen uh, the Zoom pictures and we gather around tables there and do a Bible study each week. We just finished a series called Step, uh, the Ste Steps, no, The Way to Jesus, that's it. And we're doing Steps to Jesus at the moment, The Way to Jesus. So, um, Tashina on the left, on your right here, holding up the Bible. Tashina um, has just recently come back to our group after um, a sort of a wild experience uh, with her, her life and so on. And it's wonderful that she's rejoined us. And uh, Mark and Sheena there on, on the left. And of course, Dulcie, that you've seen before. We also have Rosemary and, uh, and Linny. Uh, Rosemary is, uh, she says she's got family from Raukin, which is uh, the community where, uh, if you notice the man on the $50 note, that's his, uh, his area. And so her mother, mother's family from there and her father from Bordertown. And she's a wonderful grandmother and great grandmother in our group. Um, uh, faithfully coming along. Uh, now just on the left here, uh, I do have his name, but uh, he uh, um, was a carer for some APY folk, and as I visited them and to share some Bible studies with them, some Bible study guides, he, he looked at the picture on the Bible study guides. You see, you see the picture there of, of Jesus on the... On the uh, on the, on the guide there and he says oh that, that man there he's done a lot for me I pray to him and, and he answers my prayers so yeah. he, he was very keen to get his hand on some Bible study guys based on on that so we shared together and uh, I, I shared with him the postcard of course and the, and the steps to Jesus study guides 
Uh, now, Nikki is here, and uh, Hannah, uh, uh, studying the Bible there, and um, joins our, our group. Also went out to Lorraine and uh, Kayleen out, out there at uh, Davenport. And last time I came through, I went to Wyala, and on the way back, I stopped in at uh, uh, Lorraine and, and Daryl's place, and uh, we closed Sabbath together there out at Davenport, and uh, that was a special time. Uh, Colleen, of course, um, a lady at, at uh, Barossa Church. Some of you might know Jeanette Chudley. No? Yeah. Jeanette Nelton, yes, you know? Yes? And Jeanette uh, often gives me things and says, could you pass these on to somebody? And uh, so I, I had a, a, a painting picture there with a, with a verse on it, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary burden, and I'll give you rest. And I uh, felt impressed to share that with, with Colleen, who said that this is one of her favorite verses. And so I've shared that with uh, Jeanette as well. And she's given me something else here today uh, to share. Happiness held is the seed. Happiness shared is the flower. That, that's a good one. Now, there's one lady who was brave enough to share this morning. Well, it was like a flower to us. So I'll give that to you after. That's all right. You can put that somewhere in your home. Happiness held as the seed. That's the potential, isn't it? What God's done in our life is like a seed. As we share it, it becomes a, a flower. Hmm. Okay. Oh, okay. So there's uh, Becky visiting um, Sharon. Sharon and Karen. Of course, Sharon and Karen lost their mum earlier this year. Is that right? Yeah. It was earlier this year, wasn't it? Yeah. So much has happened this year. <laughs> it's hard to keep track. And uh, this, this one, I, um, I think I sent this picture through to Pastor Dieter as well. The, the, the uh, rainbow over the, uh, the city of Port Augusta. So there's God's promise. Amen. God's looking after Port Augusta. Yeah, just the other week when there was rain, a beautiful rainbow. Now, Wyala, uh, a few weeks ago when I was there, this is the first time that a lady from Kiri, Kiwikara in Western Australia visited an Adventist church, and she came first to Wyala. And this is her daughter, Teresa, whose partner is Jamie Doolan from Fink. So what, this is a little hint there that Fink, the connections with Fink go far and wide. Uh, even to Port Augusta, but uh, up to Kiwikara as well. And Teresa came along to the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Wyala because her partner, Jamie, and her had been to the Fink Church, and she decided she'd come along to the Adventist Church. So her, uh, she and her brother, Bernard, who's standing up there, Georgie Doolan, of course, who you'd know, and some of the children that uh, came along to church there. So I think we had nine children at Wyala Church a few weeks ago there. It's a, it's a bustling... Uh, uh, church and many many new new folk coming along there is a blessing. Una Dada, I'll come back to that in a moment but uh, the, their group meetings. Gary and Coralie Young who were here a number of years ago, um, they, they're doing uh, work up at, at Cooper Pedia and Una Dada. So there's the thing. Um, I couldn't uh, put a, a, a mark on the, the map there but it's right in the middle of Australia isn't it? And the Fink Church in the background there when it was opened. Um, and recently, I, I've lost count of the weeks, I think it could be five weeks or six weeks ago, a group of uh, missionaries from the Fink, uh, some of Lorraine's family, d decided to go from Fink to a place called Kenmore Park, which is in the eastern side of the APY land. So on the map here, um, basically from there, it's sort of like that, isn't it? It's like a, like a, um, about 500 thousand square kilometers uh, is a designated uh, area called the APY lands, Anagu, Pichinjara, Yankujara, yes, lands, and uh, in, the, in the eastern side of that there's a place called Kenmore Park, where there's a, mainly a Fraser family that live there, mainly, mainly the Frasers, and not a large community, just a small community, and a group uh, including Evelyn and Susan, I've been told, uh, headed across there to spend a weekend, to spend a Sabbath at Kenmore Park. That's good, isn't it? That's good. And uh, it gets better because when they got there, uh, they started sharing and uh, 
I think uh, the old man, uh, um, Donald Fraser, Donald and Murray, uh, he said, no, no, uh, Sunday's the right day. He said, Sunday's the, the right day to worship. Now, his, I think it's his grandson. It's Marianne's son. Uh, so one of Donald's daughter's son said, no, I've been reading my Bible, and Saturday's the Sabbath, the seventh day. And so that community in Kenmore Park on the eastern side of, of the APY lands has started to worship on Sabbath. Isn't that amazing? Yes, yeah, so missionary efforts there. And uh, that gets, gets me excited to see what God is doing through the Fink Church. 14 years since they built the church, I think, there. And uh, now they're sending out missionaries to other communities. Uh, and I'm hoping that some of them will come down to Unidata to support uh, what's, what's coming up next as well. Uh, I'll just share a verse with you here. Um, Isaiah 55, 10 and 11 describes how God's word is like the weather, like, like the rain. As the, the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. It's amazing the different seasons. You, you probably see it here. The tourists come through, at least in a non-COVID year. <laughs> <laughs> and there's wildflowers, eh? They, they go out looking for wildflowers because when the rain comes, all of a sudden that seeming desert comes alive with, with flowers and beautiful colour. And uh, God's word is the same. The rain comes and you expect something to happen, don't you? You expect life to come out of the ground. If, if it's something you've planted, then you expect that to, to grow. If you've planted nothing, you can expect weeds to grow. Don't you? you can expect something to grow. Weeds or what you've, what you've designed to, to happen. Our garden doesn't need any encouragement. The weeds grow without any effort. God sends the rain, the weeds grow. Um, and uh, then we have to sort of tend to the garden to remove the weeds so that the, uh, the fruits and the vegetables can grow. So shall my word be that goes forth from my, uh, from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So you, you can't turn the rain back. You can't sort of switch it off. There's no button that says, I just like those drops to go up in the air again now. Once they, they started to fall, there's no stopping the rain, is there? You've just got to try and manage things. And I guess after 40 days of rain, there was no life left, was there, on, on earth? The flood came. But uh, since then, the rain has always made, an, made some difference. Uh, life has come. And uh, God's word, as it goes out, as we share our testimony, as we read about in the lesson this morning, as we share that, we should expect some kind of result. There should be some response. Either the person will say, I don't want to hear it, or they'll say, tell me more. Or, or something will go into the head, the seed will be sown, and life will spring forth. Okay, we're going to Uden Data today. Um, this is probably a view that, uh, Diana, you'd be familiar with. And what do kids say when they're in the car, on the, and this is the road? What do you say, kids? Nurture? Are we there yet? <laughs> <laughs> and so 187 kilometres or so later you'll, you'll begin to arrive there's uh, Gary and Coralie's car parked they've given up no they're still on their way and uh, you eventually arrive at Udnadatta that's the main street yeah, you've got to watch out for cars as you cross the, the main street and uh, famous for the pink roadhouse yes. that's right isn't it the pink roadhouse. Only the boys' toilet is blue. That's, uh, everything else is pink. And uh, Gary and Coralie stay at the, uh, the five-star accommodation there at the pink roadhouse. And, uh, and they, they've been faithfully going up there each month um, and running a, a Sabbath program. So they, go, they have church in the morning at Cooper Pedy, and they drive out there in the afternoon. You'd be familiar with that as well. And, uh, and uh, Diana, and uh, then uh, they run a program, and then they stay there s Saturday night and Sunday morning. They've been running some programs as well. That's the look out the back window, uh, the backyard at uh, Udnadatta. Uh, beautiful place, isn't it? Audrey was telling me about the crows there at uh, Udnadatta. She says she's never seen crows mourn 
like they do at Eden Manor. So the, the, so the crow died and apparently all the crows sort of gathered around and they, they squawked and whatever. They had their little funeral there at Eden Manor for the, the dead crow. Uh, this is the Dunjiva um, Women's Shelter, I think it is. Is that right? Lorraine can tell me. She'll just tell me it's wrong. But uh, they've been holding meetings here for the, well, since they've been able to, since the COVID um, restrictions eased. And um, on Sunday morning, uh, Coralie has been running a, a cooking uh, class. So they're making some Anzac biscuits here. And uh, a number of the ladies uh, really enjoy that. Uh, I think Sandra McCallum is on the left. Uh, um, uh, Cheryl Stewart and I think uh, Tanya Bales in that picture. Uh, and Gary, and Gary is uh, yeah, setting up those uh, for church there in the in the hall, so Sabbath Day of Church. They also have a Bible study on Sunday morning and they've been going through a series there together with uh, them. I think there's at least three requesting baptism so they're studying towards that and um, uh, really encouraged by the work that they've been doing there. There's some folk around the table. There's Keith and Jeannie Menunga, uh, KK uh, Menunga as well, uh, Edna, don't know who's in the background there. Um, and uh, is that uh, Tanya Bales next to, yeah, some la ladies there and, and men gathering around the table there in the women's shed at Udinata. There's the Church of Kipipiti. Got the great big uh, Adra um, shipping container. Don't know which boat that came from, but it's a long way from the ocean. Um, so they used to have an Adra shop there and, uh, and uh, recently renovated the church a little. And um, you remember the old carpet there, Diana? Now it's got uh, sort of a floor that you can clean easily. And uh, regularly getting along 13 to 17 folk there at, uh, at Keeper uh, each Sabbath. Now, I think this is the reason. They're, pray they're praying. They're a praying church and uh, this is a prayer board and some of the prayer requests there. They're praying for, the, uh, for people, for communities and, uh, and uh, we just praise God for that. Now... That's right. So we've had the week of prayer, haven't we? We're having it, and you're going to join tonight. I just thought I'd share a few verses related to the Sabbath reading that you'll do tonight. Um, living in the end time. And I suspect that the folk at Fink, um, Evelyn and Susan and others, uh, are sensing the urgency of the times we live in. We're in the end times. And uh, reading through the... Uh, the uh, the, the study for today, the reading for today, I noted that even back in Ellen White's time, people sort of sensed from her teaching and, uh, and sharing and, and ministry that the urgency during her lifetime. And people would say, but you've said this for years. And so we're going to look at the reason why we should always have that attitude of the urgency of uh, Jesus' soon return. Why is that important? And, that's, that's, uh, and how does that change the way we live? I'm going to give you three reasons from the, the book of uh, 1 Peter um, of why we need to have that attitude always, uh, always in our minds. So Christian lifestyle and the last days. The, the key verse at the beginning was Titus chapter 2 verse 11 to 14. And as we, before we read this one, I'll just uh, pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word and for the promise of your soon return. May you bless the reading of your word today in Jesus' name. Amen. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in the present world, looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us for, uh, from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous for good works. I've highlighted there the words, uh, the soberly. Should live soberly, righteously and godly in the present world, looking for that blessed hope. Something about being sober, isn't it, that we see things clearly. Australians are among the highest drinkers in the world. 
the most alcohol is sold here. In fact, uh, I think that was one of the restrictions that they, they were very quick to release was the access to more alcohol. It seems that uh, the country runs on that uh, liquid amber. And down where I, where I minister at Barossa as well, it's the, uh, the rose-coloured uh, <laughs> juice, isn't it? It's the, it's the wine of all kinds. And um, the wineries, uh, they were very uh, much in the lobbying of the government to reopen the wineries so people could, um, could taste the alcohol again. Be sober. But so, being sober is not just about not being drunk, is it? It's about paying attention. Uh, a person who can drive for many hours on the road eventually begins to behave like a person who's actually drunk. Fatigue sets in and, uh, and the reaction times are slower as if they had been drinking alcohol. Being sober, being watchful. So, three lessons. Let's turn to 1 Peter, chapter 1. Three times the word sober is used in 1 Peter. Three times the word sober is used. And, and there's three reasons given why we should be sober in the last days. Why we should be sober in the last days. I've been reading a lot recently, um, Isaiah 24 and, uh, and uh, 28 as well, talks about the, the earth being like a drunken person swaying about. You've seen somebody that's under the influence and you can tell they're under the influence because they can't really stand you know, still or properly and, and they're, they're sort of sway, don't they? The earth swaying about. And in the days of Isaiah, people would get drunk in order to have dreams and visions. I remember going to um, Coffs Harbour. Those of you who've been to New South Wales, Coffs Harbour, there's a place called the Big Banana. Everything in Australia you've got to have big, big galah, big banana, big uh, apple. I don't know what, what else they've got, but um, big the big koala. Yes, yeah, the big rocking horse. Um, so the big banana had, uh, had this train ride, and on the train ride they went past this pond and they said, in here is the bunyip. And up comes the, you know, the bunyip out of the water, the mechanical creature, and we all go, oh, wow. And they said, it's a mythical Australian creature, often seen on the way home from the pub, but never seen on the way to the pub. Your eyes will see strange things, the Bible says. When you drink alcohol, you see strange things. Being sober. So the first reason we should be sober in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 says, Therefore prepare your minds for action, and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Why should we be sober or sober-minded? So we can discern, prepare your minds for action. It's sort of parallel, isn't it? It's the same thing. Do, do sports people going to the Olympics next year now, <laughs> the, the Olympics, imagine, you know, the, the, the Usain Bolt or somebody, you know, preparing for the great race, downing a few just before the race. Are they going to win? Not a chance. The, the reaction time will slow. They'll be running all over the place. Prepare your minds for action. So there's, a, there's something ahead that we need to be alert for. So, set, uh, what is it? Why do we need to prepare? Because of the grace that, that we're going to be given when? When Jesus comes. So when Jesus comes, we're going to receive this reward. Therefore, be sober-minded and focus. Keep, keep your focus. So because of what reward we're getting, eternal life, I'm going to choose to be uh, prepared for action. I'm going to choose to be sober-minded now. That's the first reason. Because of what heaven, heaven's reward, I'm going to be sober-minded. The second reason is found in chapter 4, verse 7. So being sober-minded because of what Jesus is preparing for us. I don't want to miss out on that because I'm drinking, or I don't want to miss out on that because I'm filled up with the cares of this world. That's the first reason. Second reason is the end of all things that is at hand, therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. 
What reason here is given for being sober? Or sober minded? Clear thinking. Because soon the world is going to come to an end, isn't it? And whether that's in my lifetime or whether I die before it happens, I, I need to live with that mindset that all of this stuff is going to be no more. The houses, the, the flash cars, the, the, uh, uh, the wealth or whatever, everything is going to be destroyed. So with that in mind, I need to be sober-minded. And the other reason? For the sake of your prayers. Have you had that experience of being distracted in prayer this week? <laughs> We kneel down and we pray and we start thinking about what jobs I need to do. And you think, oh, oh I, I better, I'll come back to the prayer, I'll go and do something else. And so we become distracted. For the sake of what's about to happen in, on the earth, in Earth's history, for the sake of your prayers, be self-controlled and sober-minded. Self-control is one of those fruit of the Spirit. And the next few verses there in 1 Peter 4 describe the fruits of the Spirit or the gifts of the Spirit. Hospitality, um, love, covers a multitude of sins. Um, all these gifts come from being self-controlled, sober-minded and answers to prayer. So the first reason, being sober-minded because of the reward that we're going to receive. If I know I'm going to get a gold medal at the Olympics, I'm going to train. <laughs> That's the reward, isn't it? Getting the gold medal, I'm going to train hard. I'm going to eat the right food. I'm going to drink the right drink. I'm going to, I'm going to wake up early. I'm going to do whatever it takes to be in the best condition to receive that prize. The second one is for the sake of my prayers, for the sake, uh, because everything else is going to be destroyed very soon, I'm going to be sober-minded as well. And the last one, this is one that we all know. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. I'll read the, uh, the, the previous two verses for you as well. It says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxiety on Him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a... Oh, I've spelled around there with an eight in there. That'll remind you. He prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Have you felt that? Have you experienced that? So because there's danger, we need to be sober-minded and watchful. At the moment, the world is fixated on the fear of, I don't want to catch COVID-19, right? And because of the danger, we do certain things to prepare to, to protect ourselves. This one says, we've got to prepare not only against some virus, but against the lion who is prowling around, wanting to devour us, eat us up. And in the same kind of precautions we take for COVID, we should take the same and more so uh, being sober-minded and watchful because the devil is prowling around. Why is he prowling around? It's related to the other two reasons. He knows his time is short. He knows that the end is coming. He knows the first two reasons to be sober. He knows that God is going to give a reward to the faithful when he comes. And he knows that the end of all things is coming and he'll be finished. His kingdom will be over. And for that reason, he wants to take as many of us out with him as he can. And, and therefore, be sober-minded and watchful. Watchful is another way, way, way of saying prayerful, isn't it? Being, being on our guard, being prayerful. I used to worry about people, uh, uh, monsters under the bed. You know, as a, in the dark, you're afraid of something, and, and I'd jump out from the bed, being very watchful, hearing noises at night and so on, being afraid. But uh, that's why I read those first couple of verses. Be, uh, be humble yourselves before God, uh, and uh, then um, be sober-minded. So as we submit to God, resist that devil, and he will flee from us. Can you remember those three points? Be sober-minded because 
Jesus has got a great reward for each of us. He's sober-minded because we want our prayers to be heard and answered and, and, and we, we know that everything else is going to be destroyed except our relationship with Jesus. And finally, be sober-minded and watchful because the devil is very real and active and wants to tear our families, tear our lives apart. And uh, only as we submit to God, uh, only as we humble ourselves before Him, only as we're watchful and careful in what we drink, in what we eat, in what we company we keep, in where we go, uh, can we uh, resist and uh, overcome the devil through Jesus' strength. I'd like you to pray for me as well. Uh, I've mentioned Udnadatta. Um, I'm heading up there. That's the per one of the purposes of my trip this time, is to support the work that uh, Pastor Gary and Coralie have done so far in Udnadatta and Kupapiti. So tomorrow I'm heading up to Kupapiti, and then uh, Monday through to Fink, uh, with Pastor Gary and Coralie uh, to encourage the folk there to support or pray or um, just uh, be aware of the meetings. And then from next Sabbath afternoon, um, I'll be in Udadada for two weeks running a series of, of meetings each evening there for the folk and encouraging them because uh, we don't want just the people in the cities to hear and be ready for Jesus to come. We want uh, people in every community the, uh, Revelation 14 tells us every nation, tribe, tongue and people. Right. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the uh, privilege of knowing you and of sharing uh, your message in these last days as well. May you keep us uh, watchful and sober-minded uh, each day as we think of the, the reward that you have prepared for each of us and for those who are faithful to you when you come. As we think about the end of all things, that uh, our, our view is not of this world, but of you and, and what, what you have prepared. And finally also that we might be more conscious of the great battle that is taking place and put our trust in you and submit our lives to you. We might be able to resist the devil through your strength and uh, be aware that he is trying to devour us but you are there to protect. May our, our confidence and our faith, our trust be in you. And now and always is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.